please welcome Tim Walsh. Applause, applause, Thank you, applause. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen so you don't have to look at my head the whole time. This will be better. And I know a lot of you are probably zoomed out by now. So my goal is to make this very fun and interactive. So thanks for joining us. So I'll start by showing you this chair and asking you to take a chair, but not just any chair. This is a 1970s classic plastic strap woven folding aluminum lawn chair. So my question to you is, did you take this chair or did this chair take you? Maybe back in time to your boyhood or girlhood backyard and a wiffle ball game and 4th of July picnic. Um, for me, this chair takes me to 1974 and sort of the nexus of my talk to you this afternoon, which involves creativity and competitiveness and curiosity. And all of those things sort of came together and informed who I would become. So before I take you to my boyhood backyard, though, I think we should talk a little bit about play because there's a lot of misconceptions about it and uh, everyone's experience of play is different right so um, I like this comment by Stuart Brown that play is an experience and talking about play is like shooting down a bird of paradise and trying to dissect it right because play is very individualistic and it's important to understand how you like to play so I like this four-part definition by Peter Gray uh, number one, play is self-directed. If you're doing something and you feel obligated to do it or forced to do it, then what you're doing ceases to be play. Because as I mentioned earlier, play is very individualistic. What's terrifying to me, clowns, might be terrific for you. And tinkering on an, uh, an old motor might be absolutely, you know, play to me and, and pointless to you, right? So play is very individualistic. Secondly, it's an activity where the means are more important than the ends. And this is often difficult for people that are hyper competitive to sort of understand, right? Because for them, it's all about the winning and the losing. But if you want to really get the most out of play, then you sort of have to convince yourself to uh, enjoy the journey and not just the destination. Thirdly, play is uh, guided by rules, but it, it, it's open for creativity, right? Because I believe we were created to create and play is often um, most enjoyed when we are open and allow for surprises to happen. And I know in, in the context of using play to problem solve, which more and more businesses are doing every day, often it's the answer that is least expected that comes when people are open and playful. So play is guided by rules, but we always wanna keep in mind that we want it to be open. And then lastly, it's conducted in an active, alert, relaxed, non-stressed frame of mind. And we're gonna talk about animals in a second. And if you introduce stress into the animal world, play stops, right? So that sort of tells you that it's kind of hard to have a real stressful situation and play at the same time. Active is another, Part of that definition that I think is important. You may enjoy watching a sporting event on television or uh, watching a movie, but that's not really play. It's certainly entertainment, um, but play calls us to be active uh, participants and not just spectators. So there's sort of an overview of play. And I realize that as a play advocate, not everyone shares my enthusiasm for this subject, particularly in the Western, our Western culture work is often valued and play is sort of looked on as like you're uh, a parent glaring at a kid, you know, stop playing with that, right? It's sort of a, a, a negative thing in our culture. And we know that by looking at some of the definitions of play, but the opposite of play is not work. The opposite of play is depression, as Brian Sutton Smith, a play theorist, famously said, right? So we know there's a negative connotation to play in our culture because of some of the expressions that have sort of creeped into our lexicon. If uh, you hear something about someone playing around, that means they're a philanderer. If you play the field, you're a cheater. If you're playing, you're exploiting someone, right? You don't, you're exploiting someone if you play with them. If something is played out, it's stale or overused, uh, hackneyed, if we hear that expression. 
if you play down something, you're making light of it, and on and on and on, right? There's a plenty of expressions that have to do with play that are considered negative. So play has a PR problem. So to begin with, I want to look at something I've created, which is a play scale and how you perceive play. So you can ask yourself, where do I fit on this perception of play scale? So chances are, if you have a poor perception of play, if you think that play is, you know, really just frivolous, uh, pointless, and that might be because perhaps you had a, a domineering parent that every time you tried to play, they sort of squashed it. Uh, you may not even realize it as you're now an adult that you have a poor perception of play. Um, you're going to be annoyed by play. That's just the way it's going to be. Um, sorry, my mouse sort of froze here. You'll be annoyed by play. If you have a petty perception of play, if you think it's sort of frivolous, and, you know, I guess it's good in small batches, small doses, but overall, you know, it's, it's, you consider it pretty petty, then you're going to be kind of neutral about play, apathetic toward it, kind of a leave it, take it or leave it uh, disposition toward it. If you have a positive impression of play, if you can easily see the benefits of it, then of course you're going to be amused by play. And if you're like me, if you feel like uh, play is profound, then it's a means through which, as Lois said in the introduction, uh, a means through which we can connect with the people we care most about. And um, we're going to talk about the effects of play with kids, it's a way that your brain and your being actually gets formed, then you're going to have a profound uh, idea of play and be amazed by what play can do. So no matter where you are on this scale, my hope is that at the end of this conversation, you'll be nudged a little bit to the right, uh, no matter where you are on this play scale. So we'll start with the big picture, the planet plays, right? So many animals play, like this guy. This is object play. So a dog with his stick or an otter with her stone, right? This is object play. Play fighting is a big part of uh, the animal world. These two polar bears are play fighting. And I'm always entertained by this photo because it looks like they're telling a joke to one another as well, but they're play fighting. But think about how important play must be because these two animals live in the harshest of environments right? They are, they have to find food, they have to find shelter, or they're going to die. And yet they play. And you have to ask yourself if they're willing to expend those precious resources of time and energy to play, then of course play must be important. And it's not something that can be dismissed because play isn't silly to these animals. Play is selected. It has been selected over time because there's value in it. And of course, it doesn't take a lot of mental energy to see that an animal for hunting in the future. But it's so much more than that because when you think about how play informs uh, a young animal about their environment, it also informs them about themselves in that environment. So think about how important it is an animal to know how fast they can run, how important it is for an animal to know how high or far they can jump, how quiet they can be if they need to be, or how, or how loud and scary they need. I think we lost your video, Tim. Oh, really? Oh, you're back now. Okay. Your internet connection is unstable. Oh, that's unfortunate. Okay, well, if, you, if we're back, you just let me know, Lois, if we lose again. Yep, I will. Sorry about that. Okay. So is everyone looking at a picture of a baby? Yes. Okay, good. All right, well, for John, so the eye contact, that bonding play is what we're looking at here. And it's the beginning of something uh, that allows a kid to be uh, emotionally stable. It allows them to regulate their self-emotion and, uh, or excuse me, their self-regulation of their emotion. And touching like the hand, the parent's hand here on the baby's arm, that soothing, that touch uh, helps babies to um, figure out how to soothe themselves, that skin-to-skin -skin contact. 
So the beginning of um, communication and emotional expression is formed at this time. So eye contact, we all make funny faces at babies. That's how they learn emotion. And of course, when you do baby talk and cooing and all that, it's the beginning of emotions, right? So there's a famous game called peekaboo that we all know. And interestingly, researchers have found that peekaboo play is in 17 diverse cultures all around the world. It's a, a universal in these cultures. And what it is, is it happens between four and seven months. And the psychologist named Jean Piaget uh, coined the phrase object permanence, which is what a baby is learning when they play peekaboo. Because when mom covers her face with her hands, she's gone to the child, right? And then, oh, she's back. So peekaboo play is something where a kid, a child learns object permanence from a young age. And that bonding is something that researchers have found in its absence is really devastating. There's a researcher named Alan Shore from UCLA, and he has found that a bonding play or attunement, as he calls it, if that is missing, then that child grows up to have difficulty forming healthy relationships, even as an adult. So that's how important it is for young kids to be played with and to play. And sadly, we know a lot about this from Romanian orphanages. So in 1989, when communism fell and Romania had to open their doors to the West, uh, over 100,000 orphans were found in orphanages across Romania. These kids were abandoned, stored really in these orphanages. They weren't played with. Um, and the mortality rates in these orphanages were really high crazy high, a uh, 40% mortality rate in some of them. And when you think about it, it's shocking because these kids had food, water, shelter, clothing, and yet many of them died. Why? Well, later it was discovered it's failure to thrive syndrome. Basically, they died from a lack of touch, a lack of play, a lack of connection, that skin-to-skin -skin contact that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, play is needed from the time that we're born. So there's six stages of play. Uh, a sociologist named Mildred Parton came up with these six stages. We're not gonna talk about them in great depth. We're gonna talk about the last one, which is cooperative play. And this has such amazing benefits for kids that it really is worth some time spending talking about it. Because in this stage of play, it's where kids learn the advanced skills of conflict resolution. Um, it's where they're learning problem solving skills, getting along with their peers, um, and connecting with their peers. And uh, it's just, it can't be overstated how important this stage of play is. So it's a common, uh, you know, report card accolade, and it's on coffee mugs and t-shirts, plays well with others, but how important is that? Well, so when my wife and I had our kids, we tried to avoid the common parental thing where you compare your kids to other kids, right? So we, we didn't do that. But of course, other well-meaning parents would say, well, when did Kate first start walking? Or when did she first start talking? You know, our Jenny started walking when she was two, right? Um, I have yet to hear a college entrance exam or a wedding proposal, for that matter, that asks the question, so when did you first start walking, right? Every institution of higher learning, and the institution of marriage for that matter, the only thing that really matters is, is this person socially well adjusted, right? Can I get along with this person? Does this person know how to interact and play well with others? That's the important thing. So as a parent, you are successful if you can establish uh, in your child the ability to play well with others. And Again, looking at the, the negative side of this, it's heartbreaking to look at when a child doesn't figure this out. So researchers have found that um, kids that don't play well with others, meaning they are not socially integrated with their peers, by the time they're four, never get socially integrated with their peers. They are outsiders from that point forward, and it really is heartbreaking. So John Coy and Kenneth Dodge are researchers that have discovered that if you're not integrated with your friends 
and socially uh, on the same level with them, by the time you're four, you never really get it. You're unaccepted by your peers because you don't know how to play. And the smallest things that most kids learn about uh, that aren't that big of a deal to you are a very big deal because you've never learned that, oh, I don't always get to win or, oh, I always don't get to play the game I want to play. I have to learn how to take turns. And they seem like such superficial things, but if you never learn them, it can be really, really devastating. So that's one of my frustrations as a, a play advocate because people who are very serious, who don't think of play as just frivolous, um, Ironically, they don't think about play seriously enough because they don't get it. Because of course, play is not all sunshine and silliness. There is a tremendous amount of negative emotion that a kid, and an adult for that matter, but in this context, we're talking about kids, learn to deal with. For instance, that peekaboo play that we were talking about earlier, that's an ex existential crisis to a child. Mom is gone oh my gosh, where did mom go? Oh, there she is, right? So that's a small snapshot of a bit of negative emotion you're giving to a child through play to teach them how to deal with it. And of course, on the playground, uh, years later, because that this is the beginning of play, cooperative play is the last stage, you're learning much bigger world-changing things like getting along with others. And people that don't learn this, have a lack of empathy, they're self-centered as adults, and they experience a really hard time adjusting to negative emotion because they never learned it from a very young age. Like this little fella, cooperative play is really hard to learn, but it's certainly something that most kids do learn by the time they're four and their lives are so much more rewarding because of it. It's a critical play phase. Now, maybe you're another kind of parent where you think, you know, I, I, I'm not like that person that thinks play is just total frivolity and there's nothing positive to it and it's just silliness. You might be on the other end of the spectrum and, spectrum and say, well, of course play is a good thing, but, but if you go too far, you can say, well, play is a good thing, but it always should be quiet and soft and peaceful and, um, as quiet as possible, right? Well, most parents know good luck with that because there's a form of play, which is a subset of cooperative play called rough and tumble play. Again, coined by Jean Piaget, the child psychologist. And in this rough and tumble play, kids uh, play fight. It's ag agonistic behavior, right? It's play fighting, it's chase games. Um, and uh, people that know kids, of course, see it all the time. So now these two are fighting, they're play fighting. Now, no one in their right mind would look at these two and think, oh my gosh, I have to break this up, they're going to kill each other, right? No one would dream of doing that because we all know instinctively these two are not about to kill each other, they're play fighting. So if you wouldn't break up this play fight, then you certainly shouldn't break up this one. Now, the key part of rough and tumble play is that everyone participating in it is having a good time. Obviously, if one kid starts crying or continually cries, then there's an issue, it went too far. But this is something that kids do and should be encouraged to do. And a lot of parents sadly stop rough and tumble play because they misunderstand or misconstrue that, oh, this is violence. This is uh, terrible when in actuality it's very normative and there's great benefits to it. And here are just a few of them. Self-regulatory skills, right? You learn how to regulate your emotions and you learn the basic <laughs> things like you don't always get to win in a game, right? I'm not a fan of cooperative games that are cooperative only because there can never be a winner and a loser because unless you learn how to be a gracious loser, then you're delaying learning that until later in life, and that can be devastating. Uh, to lose for the first time when you go into college could be devastating to a child. Social competence, right? Positive peer relationships are learned through rough and tumble play. This is a huge one, recognition of social signals. I ran into a kid, um, I won't go into the details, but basically he was a 13-year-old four-year-old 
13 years old, but had no recognition of a social signal that he was being annoying to his peers because uh, he never understood what the social signal was that's saying, hey, you're being a crybaby or whatever. Uh, and it really was just very, very sad. There's uh, big school development improves uh, cooperation. Self-handicapping is a huge thing. So in this picture, an older uh, sister is playing with her little brother. Now, she learns instinctively to self-handicap because if she catches him instantly every time they play a chase game or pins him instantly every time they wrestle or they're, they're going to play hide and seek and he hides and she walks right up and finds him immediately, guess what happens? The play stops and he won't want to play with her again. So she learns self-handicapping and fair play through this rough and tumble play. Finally, it teaches negotiation, which is, again, a huge part of being a competent adult. So there's, you know, this poor kid, maybe he didn't learn how to play rough and tumble play. Or more, more possibly, you know, he could have hurt a kid and didn't understand that, hey, when a kid says, hey, that, that hurts, that's too much, they learn that, right? Or maybe they were protected. A lot of parents, again, uh, don't understand that this is an important, normal part of childhood, and they try to stop rough and tumble play every time it starts. And this poor kid never learns how to integrate himself with other kids and what's going too far and what uh, he can and can't do to someone else. Um, and I liken it to, whoops, went backwards here. Sorry about that. My mouse is acting up a little bit. My mouse is playing with me. Um, it reminds me of a story by uh, a writer named, um, uh, sorry, I'm, his name is escaping me here. Where is it? Well, it'll come to be in a minute. It's, oh, Dennis Merritt Jones. And the story is they wanted to grow trees, right? and they wanted to grow trees in a, in a perfect environment. So they created these biodomes. And in the biodomes, uh, it was the perfect environment. Purified air, uh, really healthy water, uh, healthy soil, filtered light, et cetera, et cetera. And the trees growed great as you can imagine. Uh, they grew to a certain height, and then surprisingly, they just fell over and died. And the people that were in charge of the biodome were like, what's going on? and they didn't account for the lack of wind. So there's no wind in a biodome. So wind stresses the tree as it grows and that makes the tree's roots go deeper and makes the tree stronger. So the analogy I'm making here is that if you want to have a strong kid, then they need to be exposed to an appropriate amount of stress that will make them strong and walling them off sadly will make them weak which is the opposite of what most parents of course want they think they're protecting their kids by walling them off when in actuality they're making them weak and it's hard for me to be over you know critical of parents the helicopter parents as they're called today because we're having fewer and fewer kids right so in essence uh, young parents today often have one or two kids and they're, all their eggs are in one or two baskets, so to speak. And it's certainly true that the more kids you have, the more they raise, uh, their siblings raise each other. So I'm one of six kids, right? So I'm number five and six. So by the time my parents got to me, they were just done with the whole parenting thing. I was on my own. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding, of course. I had great parents. But it is true that as siblings we sort of raised each other quite a bit there was l a lot of rough and tumble play growing up as a kid um we also i got a lot of hand-me-down toys that weren't uh didn't function very well because they had been played with for a couple decades and i remember distinctly having a basketball that would not hold air and it wouldn't bounce and i went to my dad and i said i think we need a new basketball that i keep pumping this thing up and it won't hold air and his response to me was, there's no money for a new basketball. Go play, right? And I remember very shortly after that thinking, what sport or game could I come up with with a basketball that wouldn't bounce? And we did that all the time as kids, invented our own toys and games. And I think that if I had grown up in a more affluent family where we got brand spanking new toys, 
I would not have grown up to be a toy and game inventor because what we play with and how we play informs who we become. And we did play dangerously. We had lawn darts. Remember those? A weighted spike that you lobbed in the air. What could possibly go wrong, right? Yeah, we had lawn darts. We call them jarts. Uh, and we played with dangerous toys as well. Wiffle ball was one of my favorite toys growing up. If you don't know, this is a ball that will curve on its own. Um, and it's made for confined spaces. So it was invented, I found out much later, uh, by a pitcher. He was a former semi-pro pitcher, and he was trying to help his son, who was trying to throw a curveball and hurting his elbow and complaining, I just can't throw a curveball and my elbow hurts. And his father thought, you know, I bet I could make a ball that curves on its own and gave the world the wiffle ball. But it doesn't travel very far when it's hit. So it's kind of a backyard sort of game. And if it hits a window, it won't break anything. So that's a little background on wiffle ball. And we loved to play wiffle ball as kids because, as I said, it curved. And I remember that the mulberry tree was the right, uh, the right bow pole and the laundry uh, pole for hanging laundry, the clothesline pole, was the left field. And I don't remember a lot of discussions about fair and foul balls, but I do remember a lot of big time disagreements over balls and strikes because our strike zone in my boyhood backyard was a piece of plywood against our house and we had duct taped a little strike zone. And the problem was is that if you were pitching and a ball kind of hit the line, you were like, that's a strike. And the batter would say, no, it hit over here and that's a ball. And we were pretty competitive kids, right? So this was a problem because unless we, you know, invented video replay um, or some way to tell balls and strikes, our wiffle ball days were numbered because we were getting in all these arguments. Well, enter the classic plastic woven aluminum folding lawn chair because we discovered that if we use that chair as our strike zone and put that up against the plywood, it made a very different sound when a ball hit that chair. No matter where it hit on the chair, it would make kind of a metal sound. So we knew that if we heard a thud, it was a ball because it hit the plywood. And if it made a tink, kind of a metal-y sound, it hit the chair. So we had devised a way to use auditory signals from this chair to save our wiffle ball days. Now, if you would ask me back then, is that when you became a toy and game inventor? Of course, I'd say no, we were just trying to solve a problem. Of course, years later, I would figure out and find out that much problem solving uh, has to do with creativity and creativity helps you solve problems. And that's what we were doing as kids. But certainly we were also inventing something, a, a different way to create a strike zone. And this, backyard game really informed who I would become on many different levels. One is, I dreamed of playing baseball. This is imaginative play, a role play. I grew up in New Jersey and my team were the Phillies and Steve Carlton was this pitcher who threw this ball that curved so much that batters would miss it by like three feet and it was just amazing. And I said, oh, I really wanna throw a ball like that. And it was fantasy play, role playing, which kids often do. 15 years later, I would play professional baseball in Mexico. And I got to sort of live that dream. And it started in my backyard through imaginative role play. The second thing that I learned from my boyhood wiffle ball days was how to create. Like I said, to create, oh wow, this is a new way to make a strike zone. 15 years later, that creativity would lead me to enter the game field. And I invented my first commercial board game in 1989. Uh, and if, as I said earlier, if I didn't have a childhood where I was making up games and sports, there's no way I would have entered that career. And then lastly, I was always really curious about wiffle ball because I was just fascinated with how it worked, how the air went into one hemisphere with the holes and that kind of created drag which made the ball curve. And the only thing I knew about it was that it was invented by a company called the Wiffle Ball Incorporated in Shelton, Connecticut. But look at that patent number. There was a patent number on the box. And I remember years and years later, looking up that patent number and seeing 
David Mullaney's name and, and learned that he was a pitcher. And I heard the story of how he created it for his son who wanted to learn how to throw a curveball. And 30 years later, I would end up writing a book all about toys and how they were invented. And it was that curiosity, right? So it was the competitiveness, the competitiveness of wanting to play at the highest level and dreaming through role play of being a professional baseball player. It was the creativity of play that it took to come up with that strike zone and just the curiosity of how things work that I got from play as a kid that all informed who I would become. And I would never have been a professional baseball player, a game designer, or a writer had it not been through this play as a child. So there's a book I would highly recommend by Stuart Brown, who I quoted earlier. He uh, founded the Institute, National Institute uh, for Play. And in his book, Play, he tells the story of Jet Propulsion Labs. And these were uh, the people that took us to the moon in the 60s. And the engineers who took us to the moon in the 60s were in the 90s getting ready to retire. So they needed to be replaced with younger engineers. And the story that he tells in this book is how difficult it was for JPL to find young engineers who could problem solve, who could figure out how to solve real world problems that became a real issue. And they started to do detailed play interviews, play histories of how these two groups of people played. And what they discovered was the older engineers played with their hands. The older engineers took apart bikes and uh, fixed clocks and they made uh, soapbox derby cars. Um, the younger engineers played on screens. And what they found was there's some connection between your hand and your brain. And Stuart Brown says, your hand is in search of your brain, your brain is in search of your hand, and play the way that those two things connect with one another. And sad, we're losing that. So now, JPL, they ask every engineer that they hire, how did you play as a kid? And if they say, I was on a screen all day, chances are they're not going to be that great at problem solving. And I must say that the kids that they were talking to were brilliant kids from MIT, Stanford, Caltech. I mean, these were not unintelligent engineers, but something in how they played was missing. And it was that hand to brain play. Uh, I do have a short video here. You may have seen this. So hopefully because of our internet connection, you'll see it. This went viral a few years ago. This is a man trying to get a bag into his overhead. And he's trying to fit a square bag into a rectangular hole and just can't seem to figure it out. So the flight attendant comes up here. <laughs> it's kind of comical. She's like, turn the bag, sir. Turn it sideways. And he just keeps pushing it. Turn it sideways. And then finally, <laughs> finally, he turns it sideways and it fits in. Now. I don't know what this man's IQ is. He might be very intelligent, but I will tell you what he did not do as a child. He did not play with a sorting block set. So a simple preschool sorting block set would have taught him how to rotate three-dimensional objects into a space. So that is a real world example. Um, if he just got a sorting block set, he would not have been overwhelmed by the overhead compartment, right? He would have figured that out. Um, so all throughout my career in toys, I've learned more and more about play and how it informs who we become. This is a dear friend of mine named Peggy Brown. And together we worked on a documentary film about this guy, John Spinello. John's an amazing guy. He was an engineer student at the University of Illinois in 1964. And he was given the job, or the, excuse me, the classroom assignment of coming up with a toy or game. And he scored the highest grade in his class with this electronic box. So what you did was you took that metal probe that you see at the top of the screen, and what you were, were called to do was insert it into those holes and in that channel and touch a plate parallel to the plate with the holes in it that you can't see. 
and you didn't want to touch the sides, if you touch the edges of the openings of any of these holes, then the, the scribe would complete the circuit and this 12 volt lantern battery would go off and scare the living daylights out of you. I played with this prototype and it was so loud that you just jumped a foot uh, when the connection was made. Uh, many of you probably have figured out the connection. That prototype went on to become the classic game operation, which is a Milton Bradley game. Now it's Hasbro, but um, you take metal tweezers and you're trying to get out the little bones uh, without touching the metal sides or a buzzer goes off and scares you. The patient's nose lights up. And um, this game went on to sell 45 million copies all over the world. Well, we asked John how he played as a kid and he told us this story. He said, well, I remember one time it was a hot day and I was walking down the street with a buddy and we walked over this sewer grate and we looked down and there were all these coins down there, like, you know, quarters and dimes. And he's like, wow, and like, how do we get these coins out of there? And he took a long stick and because it was hot, he had tar from the asphalt, you know, sticky tar. He put on the end of a stick and reached down into this hole and fished out the coins one at a time by sticking them to that tar. Now you think about the analogy between those two things, how similar that play is to operation. You're taking something and you're getting something of value out of a hole with metal openings and you can't hit the sides because the buzzer will go off and scare you. And in this case, the coins will fall off your stick if you hit the side. And then one part of the story I didn't tell you is after he got all the coins out, this big guy came out of the shop uh, right beside the, the, uh, the uh, grate and said, that's my money. And the, scared the kids and the kids ran off and he couldn't catch them. But at the end, they were scared, just like in operation when you jump when the buzzer goes off. So I was amazed that he told that story. If that isn't a direct analogy of what you play with and how you play as, as a kid affects what you do later in life, it's just amazing to me. But the rest of the story for John, sadly, is that he sold his patent on operation for $500 and he never made another cent on the game. So even though it sold 45 million and still selling today, 45 million copies, I think it's in 50 countries. John never made any money on the game. And he and I and Peggy became friends. And later in his life, he had some issues. He needed surgery that he couldn't afford. So Peggy and I had the idea of doing a crowd rise campaign for him, which is a, a crowd funding where you just ask people, hey, if you've ever loved Operation and you played it with, played with that game as a kid, the inventor never made any money and he needs surgery that he can afford, you know, send him a dollar if, if you would. And what happened was it went viral. So we launched this campaign in 2016 and uh, we were inundated with media requests. John was written up all these publications. Um, he was on Good Morning America. That was my favorite story. I was talking to his wife on the phone uh, on her landline phone. And while she was talking to me, she, she, her cell phone went off and we had been coordinating with media for her and we gave out their phone numbers because everyone wanted to talk to them. And she said, Tim, I have to go. Good morning. America is on my cell phone. Um, so it went viral. And the good news is all these people wrote to John, we set up a website and they sent him a few bucks and we were able to raise $32,000. John got his surgery. But if you ask him, I mean, he was very thankful for the money, of course, but he said all the thank yous is what just touched him so deeply because he never made any money and no one ever knew who he was. And just the recognition and the thank you just meant so much to him um, that it was just really, really heartwarming. But we started to get other kinds of letters and that's what made us say, you know, I think we need to make a movie because this is just, we thought it was going to be just this feel good story about someone getting surgery because he's so loved because of what he invented. But it became a much deeper story when these emails started to arrive at this website. Um, so in the film, we tell this story, letters like this from a, a guy that said, I was fascinated by how this game worked. 
And now he has a degree in electronic. He's an electronic, uh, electric, electronic engineer. And that operation was just the kind of thing that made him start to wonder how electricity worked. He said, I couldn't believe that I could touch him down by the foot, but his nose lit up up here. Like, that's like magic. How does that happen? And he credited the game for having started his fascination with electricity. What does he do now? He's an electronic engineer. That's not an accident. How we play informs who we become. We started to get scores of letters from, oh, but before I talk about that, the very first game says the electric game. Now, elect, electric games are so common to us, but in 1965, this was really different, right? A, a game with electricity was really, really different that didn't exist. So, um, it, of course, is why kids like that electric electronic engineer was inspired by electricity. And by the way, if you are wondering if you have an original operation game, how you know you do is the surgeon is flicking ashes into the patient's face on the cover of the box. <laughs> that is no longer there. Um, but then we started getting email from medical professionals, like this nurse. I played with operation for hours on end. Today, I'm a nurse with grown children of my own, and the game sparked my curiosity for science and learning, which set me on my path to choosing healthcare as a profession. And that was the start. We started to get letters from nurses, doctors, physicians, assistants, even surgeons who said, I played with this game, and it absolutely led to my medical career like this guy. So Stephen J. Stryker, when he was 10 years old, was just Stevie Stryker and he needed surgery that apparently was pretty serious. And an aunt gave him an operation game as a way to kind of calm his fears over this fairly serious surgery. Obviously, he came out okay, uh, and he fell in love with this game. What does he do today? He teaches surgery at Northwestern University. Now, at least you think I'm exaggerating about this. He wrote to us, he told us the story, and we said, oh, we got to interview this guy. And we went to his office at Northwestern to interview him for the film. He pulled out the game that he got when he was 10 years old from his aunt and the game that inspired him to enter the medical field. And he wrote to John and said, thanks for all the joy you've provided, all the careers you've launched, and this is not a stretch, all the lives you've probably saved. And as amazing as that story is, we even got one other one that sort of tops it. This surgeon is Dr. Andrew Goldstone. Little Andy Goldstone was 10 or 11 years old in the 60s, played operation, and it planted the seed for him. Years later, he would become, again, a surgeon, but he was also an inventor. And he specializes in the head and the neck, and he does a lot of surgery on the thyroid gland, which is in your neck. And apparently there are sensitive nerves that run in and behind the thyroid gland that are very delicate. And if a surgeon hits those nerves by accident during the course of surgery, they can damage the vocal cord, the functioning of the vocal cords and, and make a patient hoarse. Um, well, nerves work on electricity. So Dr. Goldstone had the idea to electrify those nerves and electrify the scalpel so that when a surgeon is operating on the thyroid gland, if he or she gets too close to those nerves, you guessed it, a buzzer goes off in the operating room, alerting the surgeon, hey, you're getting too close to these delicate nerves. And Dr. Goldstone invented this device. Here's his patent for it. It's the uh, endoelectral tracheal tube, and it has been used in over 100,000 surgeries all around the world. Now, every kid that plays with operation will not grow up to be a surgeon, of course, but the very cool thing is some will. Just like not every kid that plays with a Lego set is going to grow up to be an architect, but I've gotten letters in my career of architects that absolutely say I was obsessed with Legos, and guess what? I'm an architect. So how we play informs who we become. And there's something I wanna share with you that should be of interest to you because I've talked a lot about kids today, but it's interesting to know that as adults, 
we are neotenous, which means we are a species that knows how to play and can play throughout our entire lives. We don't stop playing just because we're kids. And the great news is there's an innate curiosity to play and that fosters even more play. So if you wanna be more playful, I suggest that you get more curious. And we don't know where that curiosity might lead, but chances are it's gonna be fun. That's my talk about how we play informs who we become. So I think at this point, I'm gonna switch over to, um, this is my bibliography, if you want any of these resources that I mentioned. Um, but I, I guess I'll leave my screen up so you can see that and copy that down. If you wanna email me something, I, I can email anybody this, uh, this information, but I think we'll open up for questions. Thanks, Tim, that was really awesome. Um, we Good. have- it, Thank you. It, we have just one question in the chat and it says does rough and tumble play like rolling around on the ground apply to girls also oh sure absolutely like i showed that the picture of the the older uh sister playing with her younger brother absolutely it's it's really um geez i can't overstate it it's just i'm not a fan of safe spaces on college campuses um, and if you're interested in reading about that, there's a book called The Coddling of the American Mind by um, Jonathan Haidt. And it's, I get why people want to do it. They, we, we love our kids, we want to protect them, but we really do them a disservice by, by not introducing them to appropriate amounts of stress as kids. Because playground play, recess as it's, as it's known to all of us older kids, um, that's a microcosm of the world, you know, the, the, the playground is you do not always get your way. And, there, and there, yes, there are disagreements and kids figure out how to negotiate those disagreements. And girls certainly just like they play, might play differently. I believe studies show that rough and tumble play in girls often is more chase play than it is wrestling or pretend shooting or fighting or, you know, boys pretend to be shooting each other and jump on each other. Girls are a little a different, they play differently, but it's certainly considered rough and tumble play. Yes, for sure. There's sort of a follow-up question. It says, but how often do you see girls fighting like the boys in the picture? <laughs> well, you know, it, of course it depends on the, on the, the child and, and every, every kid is different, but of course, oh my goodness, the most difficult, I have two daughters and their most difficult time was middle school and negotiating the, the relationships with other girls. It wasn't boys that they had issues with, it was other girls. And um, a lot of how you learn to um, deal with negative emotion comes from interacting with other kids. And, and uh, anyone that has a kid knows, you know, I can talk till I'm blue in the face and I can't get through to my kid, but their friends can get through them immediately. So that peer pressure is often discussed in terms of you know, drinking or doing drugs, but there's also positive peer pressure. Well, hey, you know, why are you being so weird about this very small thing that happened on the playground? You know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt. Okay, I forgive you. Like, that is such a basic, I mean, we've lost the ability, it seems, to disagree with one another in our culture. It's crazy to me how, you know, polarized we are. And I wonder if there isn't just something being lost with the ability to disagree with one another and still, you know, get along. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Um, that, that, that's the only other question we have, but I would okay. like to just once again, thank you for, for the awesome presentation and the insight. And um, I realized earlier that I forgot to introduce myself. So I'll just tell you, I'm Lois Jackman. I'm the manager of cultural programming, exhibits, and grants at the Lorenzo Cultural Center. And I hope that everybody who was here today will bring some more friends with you for the next presentation, which is the first Wednesday after Labor Day. We'll have four consecutive Wednesdays in September for four more programs. And we'd love to see as many people as we can get. Sky's the limit because we are on Zoom, right? Um, one more yeah. question. Oh, thanks, it, it just, it's a comment. It just says, thank you very much for an interesting and informative talk. Then excellent presentation, thank you.
from Deborah. Thank you. And thank you. And I wanted to thank you, Lois, because you invited me to come there in person and do a couple of different talks to kids and adults. And I was really looking forward to it. So I was glad that we were able to do this, you know, abbreviated one virtually. So I appreciate the invite very much. And we've had to think creatively, right? Which is the result exactly. of play. Problem solved. <laughs> right. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, uh, thanks for joining us today. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.